Welcome to Osei Daily. Casey Porter here. So glad that you decided to tune in. Fans, today we have a very, very, very special guest. Of course, anybody that knows me knows that I hate OU. I do not hide that whatsoever. I have an OU killer on the show today. We have place kicker Luke Phillips. I can remember both of those 52-yarders. I think the other one was like 27 or 32 yards. Yep. But I remember the 52-yarders like it was yesterday. Luke Phillips, how the hell you doing, man? Man, doing really well, doing really well. So just chasing kids and, and work and family and, you know, just uh, enjoying life as it is today. Uh, gosh, that was 23, 24 years ago. So Amazing. it makes me feel old every single time somebody says, hey, the 2001 game. So, yeah. Man, I'll tell you what, it, it, it runs in the family because, of course, you hit, kicked the two fifty-two yarders in the 2001 game mm-hmm. at OU to beat OU. That was an incredible game where the Rashawn Woods catch and the TD Bryant catch mm-hmm. and all that. And then your son just kicked, I believe it was a game-winning field goal against their arch rivals. He's a jinx to beat Union. So, like, kicking these big-time <laughs> field goals from long distances to beat your arch rivals, that just runs in the family, right? Yeah, it's been really fun. He just started last year in seventh grade. He's in eighth grade now. We just turned fourteen <laughs> nice. in the end of August, and uh, so what? It what? what I'll go back. It wasn't quite a game winner. It was uh, we okay. beat him, we beat him forty six nothing. So it wasn't terrible, but um, he, he's on a really good uh, team. He's actually uh, good friends with and. Uh, who's also on his team, plays linebacker and tight end, is, uh, speaking of the 2001 game, is Rocky Kalmus's nephew. Oh, yeah. Uh, Colt Kalmus is Richie's son. So he's he's good friends with him and goes to jinx with him. And so, yeah, so it's uh, he has been uh, kicking for the last two years and decided to redo it. But he's doing a lot of uh, – a lot of fun things with uh, the kicking's aspect of it's funny he doesn't want to do anything else he just wants to kick um, he's in love with soccer which is his first passionate sport but yeah my son Bo um, 36 yard left hash hit it uh, about it came down about three quarters of the way up the upright so he, he wow. definitely hit it um, in practice um, he's with a small wind behind his back he said a 50 52 55 58 so nice he's definitely uh, you know getting it but he uh, he's he's a lot like me. He's a, a string bean bull, you know, a string string bean pole. Basically, he's about 107 pounds, so he's got a lot of a lot of growth still to go. Um, but it's just the consistency, and he's falling in love with that. So, yeah, it's uh, he's he's doing well with it. But the the eighth grade Jinx Trojans are so far undefeated, three and zero, uh, and he's he's doing really well and, and enjoying it. So it, as long as he loves it, um, I never pushed him into it. He just decided, hey, I want to do it because his friends were like, hey, you got to come play football. So it's uh, it's good to see him succeed and, and do those things, and hopefully we can uh, maybe have another OSU kicker in our future. Hey, that's that would be fantastic. And by the way, I've got a couple little birdies that chirp around the Oklahoma State campus. I heard a rumor about Luke Phillips oh. that he ran a four <laughs> four. I, I, I said, hey, I don't believe it. I got to ask him myself. I got to put him on video, and I got to get this thing confirmed. I did. Uh, I ran a four four forty. Uh, ran five hundred wow. mile. Um, so Gary, Gary, he he was there when we were there. He's still under uh, under Rob Glass. Um, G is uh, the man and the dude. If if you played football at OSU between two thousand and one and now, you know G is the dude. And if you get stretched by G, um, you know during stretch lines, then you're the chosen, right? So it was fun. Uh, every once in a while, I, I was allowed to get stretched by by g a little bit in the stretch lines on the field um now he's usually with people like you know rodriguez and you know the yeah. des bryant's of the world the the really important people that uh, you get to, <laughs> to, to see so kickers kickers are few and far between but uh g is g is the man so he can he can approve that but yeah i ran a 4440 um it was a 449 i'll be honest it's still a 4-4. So absolutely, that's absolutely. Kids. Yeah, I grew up playing basketball and soccer, and that's that's the way we'll say it. So it's 4-4. Four, four. It's the only time I don't round up. So Yeah. Yeah, you said you played soccer growing up. Soccer, basketball, and football, right? Soccer, basketball. I didn't start uh, I didn't start football until my sophomore year in high school. Um, and and it's, uh, that is a whole other story we could get into if you really wanted to. But, um, you know, my brother um, was an equipment manager. So I'm sitting out there in spring, um, went to small school at Metro Christian for high school. Um, my mom just retired from teaching there for, gosh, after 23, 24 years. Um, and my brother had gone there for many years prior. Um, 
basically I played basketball and soccer football wasn't even in the cards. Um, uh, and so played on a great club team, um, where we traveled, did a lot of different things, was getting scholarship offers and looks, um, across the country. And then uh, small college basketball at Kansas Wesleyan was, was interested, uh, as well, but, um, it was Steve Largent and Howard Twilley, um, two nice. Hours. So, uh, and then a, a guy named Jason Starosky who kicked it in the league for many yes. years and kicked it to you. Um, he, uh, so basically those, those three, um, you know, back in the day, we didn't have huddle. We didn't have, you know, video we could just send. My dad literally VH, VHS taped um, every single game, and we sent out every single kick to all the – what is now the Big 12 schools, um, Auburn, Tennessee, Arkansas, a few others, um, and, and was offered to walk on at all of those schools. So um, it, it was, you know, my both my parents graduated from OSU, so um, I, I – my birthday's in December. I came home in an orange uh, OSU uh, stocking uh, from the hospital. And so it's been in my blood. So I have the opportunity to go and, and be a recruited walk on there uh, was, was something that I, uh, I, I couldn't pass up. So, uh, you know, when people ask about Luke Phillips, and of course you go back to that 2001 Bedlam game, the first couple, the first thing you think of are the 252 yard field goals. That's, that's what everybody remembers about Luke Phillips. But I tell you what, me being the diehard Oklahoma State fan, Really, the thing that stuck out to me the most was like, this dude's like cocky and confident, like he's a <laughs> linebacker or something out there. I just love the the confidence that you portray. It's like you jogged out there, like, oh, this is only fifty two yards. It's only bedlam. I mean, hey, no problem, right? Yeah. So, and that's where I keep telling my son um, through the kicking is, look, kicking is nothing more than kicking a ball straight. If you can kick a ball straight. It's the same thing. A PAT is no different from a sixty yard field goal. If you can kick the ball straight. It doesn't matter where you are on the field. Your distance is your distance, and your kick is your kick. And, and so if you can kick the ball straight and you learn to do that, that's basically how uh, it, it can happen. So, um, yeah, I mean, I ended up I, – I ended every warm-up with a 60-yard field goal. Um, I was fortunate enough that um, – I had great teammates, um, and, and so it's funny. There's a fine line between cockiness and, conf- and confidence. I always try to walk that line. Um, I think you have to um, to be competitive and to be something that way. But I always told myself is I wasn't a kicker, um, and this is you know something that uh, I get made fun of a lot for, but I'm not a kicker. Um, I was a specialist, um, and the difference is kickers are those fat, lazy guys who <laughs> nobody likes, and you want to shove in the corner, and it's like, man, it's like all they do is – sit in the locker room and do nothing. Um, I always wanted to be what I called a specialist is I'm a athlete who goes and kicks a ball. I am an athlete who goes and does a particular job. So, um, it, you know, that way it, it kind of put it in perspective of, you know, I was hanging out with Kevin Williams. It was my locker mate. You yeah. know, he's right next to me um, going through. And then you go hang out with Tatum Bell. Then you can go hang out with Sean and you go hang out with, um, yeah, you know, any of the other specials, Cole Farden, uh, Josh Fields, all those guys, you can go hang out with so many different type of people because you've earned the respect uh, of them because you're out there, never miss weights, never missed any runs. Um, you know, when we were supposed to run with linebackers, specialists, tight ends, and uh, uh, quarterbacks during the sprints, I'd always run with the DBs, the wide receivers, and the running backs. Nice. They had to do a faster time. So um, because I could do it, Gary pushed me to do it. And so it was you, you go out there and you just try to earn the respect from those guys. Um, and so – for me, it was, hey, I can go out there. I know what I'm supposed to do. I know what my job is. Um, I was very fortunate. God gave me a, a gift to be able to kind of drown some things out um, and, and talk about, um, you know, you talk about the zone and people getting in the zone. Um, I'm not a baseball guy. However, the easiest way, if you've ever seen For the Love of the Game with Kevin yeah. Costner, right, how he clears a mechanism. Um, I was fortunate enough that it didn't matter what happened on the sideline. I could walk out there and – I didn't see anything. I didn't hear anything. It was literally like I could pick out my spot, draw that imaginary line from where I wanted to kick it to, to back down to my spot. And I didn't hear anything. I didn't see anything until after the kick was over. So it's funny is because I don't remember a lot of my kicks. Um, it, it is, it, it's, it's kind of something that, um, blessed me from that standpoint but yes you can be you can be confident you can go and hang out with those guys and i was the first one to walk down and and congratulate the offensive line 
Um, I was the you know the first one to go when D. Will would get an interception or something or have a great punt return. I'm the first one telling him off the field, uh, you know, hey, great job, and, and stopping him on the on the back and, and you know try to pump those guys up because kickers specialists get you know four or five opportunities a game if that um, they're out there grinding for. 50, 60, sometimes 80, 90 plays, um, depending on your, you know, on, on the game script and everything. So, um, yeah, so I, I, I like to think that I was out there and respected by them because of the things I did off the field um, and, and what I was helping them do on the field. So let's start with 2001, okay, okay and, and the Bedlam game where OU was getting ready to, to probably play in the national championship game. Oklahoma State was an afterthought to them. I think we came in there four and seven, something like that and as a record. Three, yeah, three and seven. Three and seven, yeah. Well, so it had not been a good year. Oklahoma State goes in there and beats OU. Tell us what you remember. Man, uh, so many things about that game. Um, <laughs> it's That's one that replays in my head over and over again. And, and as a competitor, you get locked in. Um, I'll take you pregame and walk you through other things. Is, nice. Um, so uh, my family is is a uh, kind of a house divided. My aunt and uncle are massive OU fans. Um, Thanksgiving weekend, we go and we have Thanksgiving at my aunt's house, and they're massive OU. I mean, like their dining room got turned into an entire OU. I don't say shrine, but it is. They have everything OU and he, that. So um, he he's had season tickets since like gosh forever. Uh, he's from from the west side of the state, so um, I get it. Um, and so we did that. Um, every single thing is like just omens and things like that that I saw that you know. I'm a little bit superstitious as a specialist, as a kicker, but it was, you know, if you're driving from Tulsa to Stillwater, the exit you take is exit 27 to get up on, on the loop, which is my number, right? So I'm like, man, okay. And so, and a, and a song came on and it was just like, man, okay. Like everything was just clicking that night in the hotel in, in Oklahoma city. I, I had a, it was weird. I had a dream that we were going to be to OU and it was like a blowout. It wasn't anything close, but I, on the way to breakfast, um, Miles and I were walking side by side, and he goes, "Luke, how you feeling?" I said, "Great, coach." I was like, "I had a dream last night that we're gonna we're gonna destroy OU," <laughs> and he was like, "Oh, great!" And patted me on the back and was like, "Yeah, we're our," you know. And so I remember doing that, and then getting to the game, seeing seeing my it was funny, my best friend uh, in college, he uh, Bo McMillan, he. <laughs> He was actually sitting on the steps uh, of the uh, the circle drive when we pulled up four hours before the game. Um, uh, Teddy Owens um, is a guy I grew up with. Ted Owens is his, is his dad, is a mm-hmm. f- famous you know basketball coach. Um, mm-hmm. They were walking in when we were walking in. Um, I just uh, so many things that were just like, oh my gosh, like I've got all these comfort people. It, it kind of took things away. But man, that game. Um, I remember five turnovers. I remember Marcus Jones. I remember, gosh, I hate to, I hate to put Tatum on blast like this, but man, I remember Tatum Bell just getting lit up. I, I want to say by Roy Williams, um, he had just caught it, turned around, and just got depleted. Um, Paul Jones, Marcus Jones, with the interceptions, uh, everything was just like going. Um, you know, something that uh, from a specialist standpoint that doesn't get talked about enough. Uh, Scott Elder was our punter at the time. Yes. And and we were backed up inside, maybe inside of our 10. And he literally, he crushed, just bombed a ball um, and flipped the field over their over their head. And they get tackled or the ball stops, kind of like at their own 10, 20. Completely 82 stupid. yards, wasn't it? Something like that? Something, something crazy. Yeah, something just, stupid like that, yeah. Yeah, and he ends up just crushing it and flipping the field. And it yeah. was like, oh, okay. Um, and so going from there, but – I love that you brought up earlier, you you had mentioned, oh, everybody remembers, you know, the field goals, but everybody remembers the Rashawn catch. But most people forget about the T.D. Bryant catch. Yes, right. Who literally came across the middle, took the ball out of Roy Williams' hands. Roy had his hands on it, he'll tell you that. And and so it was one of those things for him to to make that play before. Chris Massey, Elbert Craig down on the the, – goal line just smashing a kid coming across the middle um those are the it's funny i can remember where they were on the sideline watching those plays um it, that's the type of stuff that um everything's made of i remember one time looking up at the scoreboard and they turned off the uh rushing yards for ou because they had negative yards yes. rushing. It, i mean that type of stuff is where every single phase of the game you talk about offense, you talk about defense, you talk about special teams. Every single phase of the game was 
clicking right and, yeah. and that's where we, we always had the we always had the athletes we always had the guys who could play um they might not be the four or five star guys but just like today they're the guys that are they're athletic enough and they're smart enough and and when they want it enough and the coaching's there everything it just everything glued and came together at the end of the season um because i think a lot of the seniors knew hey this is my last game we're not going to a ball game um, and so I think it, a lot of that was, was massive. So, um, all of that to say is there's so many things that you could take from that game. Um, you know, and I, we haven't even talked about this and this might be a pretty good segue, but man, Josh Fields as a freshman, yes. comes in, right. And he played a little bit. Um, he played a little bit against, um, Baylor, I think the week before maybe, um, or, and it was like, Oh, okay. Like, cool like this freshman he's he's got it josh just has it he's just that alpha male hey follow me and, and so josh is one of those guys though that just uh, everybody just gravitates and loves and and he he's competitive he he's going to do what it takes to win um it, but he makes everybody else on the team around him better and so that that was a huge huge portion for josh to come in and play and it's nothing against us also was a great quarterback he came in and did his things sometimes you just need that spark Yep. Um, and Josh brought that spark. Um, but Josh, man, one of the craziest things that I've ever seen physically on a field, Josh literally comes over and he's running across the field and his, I don't think it was his thumb. His thumb is like dangling dislocated, from his, yeah. yeah, dangling from his hand. Like it's like, I mean, he dislocated it. He tapes it back up and they, they pop it before they tape it up, they pop it back into place right there on the sideline. And I mean, obviously it hurts. He tapes it up, also comes in for a play or, you know, or for a series, finishes the series and Josh comes right back out. And it's kind of like, Oh no, they took out Josh. And it's like, Oh, Josh is back. Right? So it's like, Oh, okay. So a lot of good stuff that way. Um, yeah. I mean, but there's just so many things and so many plays that, you could take from that and write your own story or talk about it for hours. So huge. Absolutely. So I think another thing about that game, of course, we remember beating OU and that's awesome. And, and we kept them for probably playing in the national title game, Oklahoma state fans, including myself, that made us very happy, but it also was a springboard to a couple of really nice years. You know, the next year you have the good, I think seven and four, you have the Houston bowl against Southern Miss. I can remember Dustin Allman like it was yesterday. He was a really good quarterback. I'm sure you remember him. Yes. And then that springboarded you to, and a couple of years later, you end up in the cotton bowl against old miss and, and, uh, the, uh, Eli Manning. Eli Manning. So yeah. it really was a springboard to a good period of time of football for OSU. It did. Um, you know, miles came in and, and really kind of brought a toughness that a lot of people, um, didn't see an issue. It was a physical brand of football. He was, you know, Bo Schoenblacher, uh, he, he disciple who played in Michigan and everything else. And he wanted to run the ball, run the ball and, and play, play action pass. Right. Um, and so it was, he brought that to us, um, that man, uh, the, going back to the Houston Bowl 2002 season, um, it was really where, wow, I mean, like some really amazing things that year happened. It was the uh, coming out of, of, of Kevin Williams, of k yeah. I mean, just what a phenomenal season, you know, oh, yeah. and, and then obviously going on the NFL and doing what he did. Um, but he, you go, you beat Nebraska for the first time in, in 41 years in that season as well. You get to a bowl game for the first time in a while. Um, and, and there's the excitement that starts building. And, and, yeah, I believe that it came from that one Bedlam game. Um, and so you start doing these things, and it's like, oh, okay. And, and now you get – uh, your first kind of four-star recruit with XLK, and then you get Bobby Reed coming in. And so it's like, okay, we're starting to build. Um, and, and then obviously it's like, Boom man, okay. yeah. And so now you you get into that 03 season and it's like, man, I, I think we opened the, the, I think we opened the season with a loss, maybe at Nebraska, if that was that year or if that was 2002, I don't remember. Uh, or I guess it would have been 2003. I think we lost at Nebraska opening the season. Um, and, and we didn't start off very well at all. And, and I'll never forget the leadership of Rashawn Woods comes in there senior year and said, I did not come back to play like this. We as a team need to do all these things. And it was a players only type meeting. And he's like, Hey, and he's yelling and screaming and getting passionate, um, which is, is not, 
it, it's not normal for Rashawn to get that type of passion out of, of something like that. Um, he's going to go handle his business and he's going to motivate those that he needs to motivate. And, and he definitely did. So we ended up going and, and playing, had an opportunity for our first 10 win season in a while, played in Cotton Bowl against Eli Manning and Ole Miss um, on January in New Year's Day bowl game. Like, that was a ton of fun to be able to be a part of seeing it go from, you know, and I traveled in 2000. So I I was brought in underneath Simmons and recruited underneath Simmons and um, a couple of the guys, Ron Calcagney um, had recruited me. And so it was like, Hey, seeing those guys leave. And then Bob Simmons, you know, fired all the staff and kept him and killer and killer Miller. And basically they ended up, um, you know, bringing a whole new staff, they get fired the next year because Bob does, and then Miles comes in. And so it's just so many things, you know, one door is shut, another one opens. And it's yeah. just amazing seeing the differences of, of how we saw it go from, you know, the three and seven years and not a lot of hope to, um, you know, nine win season in 2003. No doubt. And what do you remember of Coach Gundy back then? Um, confident. Um, yes. he was, I talked about that fine line of walking that confidence versus cockiness. Um, Gundy was very confident in everything that he knew. Um, and so being, I was really good friends with, with Cole Farden, um, and, uh, who was best friends with Josh Fields. And so I got to hang out kind of proxy with Josh a lot. Um, and so Josh and I hung out a few times and, and uh, got to do a lot of different things. And so, um, getting Josh would be hanging out with us and, you know, Gundy would walk in and kind of give a kind of, Oh, let me tell you the story when I was in college. And mm-hmm. like, it was just that young quarterback suave, like, Hey, this is, this is it. So, um, but it, 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 it rubbed off on a lot of guys. And so it gave a lot of guys, a lot of confidence. So uh, definitely Gundy was a guy who um, I don't think he's changed much uh, from then to now, maybe just a little bit um, wiser. Uh, yeah. from that standpoint, it, it, I guess is the easiest way to say more it. experiences under his belt. Correct. And so I think he, he has a lot more experiences to pull from. And, um, but back then he was quarterback's coach and kind of a OC. And so it was fun watching him develop and, and from this young type of pup coming in, getting along with all the guys, he was almost like one of the, one of the players almost. So yeah. th- that was a fun thing to be able to see. Do you remember the 2002 UCLA game? I remember that like it was yesterday. Of course, UCLA won that game, mm-hmm. but it was so cool because it was like, you know, because we had had we'd just been such a struggle for OSU since 1991. Right. We had the one good year in 97, but it was like, okay, we have a chance to get back on the national stage tonight. Here comes UCLA into town. It was special just to get them into town, mm-hmm. and then we didn't play very well, but that was kind of a neat night, even though we didn't win. Absolutely. So th- that's exactly kind of where I was going to go from it. It, it would say, man – you, you you said it perfectly. You get a chance to get back on the national stage, play somebody of, of caliber of UCLA. They're coming to Stillwater, Oklahoma, yeah. you know, and it's kind of like, oh, this will be an interesting thing for a lot of these kids. They probably never thought they would be in Oklahoma uh, doing anything, but let's play in, uh, in Stillwater. So, um, you know, it, it was a – we started out – decently well i think we went up 10-0 on them um i you know, had a short field goal i think maybe tatum had a, a touchdown or something and we go up 10-0 and then they score they get a pick six and then it was just like oh it, everything unravels yeah but it did it, sure it, did. <laughs> right and so that's frustrating but at the same time it's it's like you said it's the kind of the first step of like in first taste that we got of being on a national stage yeah and I think a lot of these guys, although they were winners in high school, had to learn how to win on this stage. And yes. so that was kind of the first, hey, we didn't win, but we're taking the right steps. We're, we're doing the right things to be able to go and do see what we need to see, do what we need to do. So, What was it like watching the Tatum Bell run against Texas Tech? I believe it was 97 yards. Still, I think it's the longest run from scrimmage for any Oklahoma State back. What was that like to see from field level? Um, so I was on the sideline, um, obviously watching from, it, it, he, he went from Weston zone towards Gallagher. Yes. Um, <laughs> did somebody put you up to this? Um, yeah, no, not, not at all. <laughs> so there, there's a, there's a fun thing. Anytime Tatum could, you know, anytime T-Speed would be able to hit the hole, this hole just opened up. And I want to yes. say it might've been Sean Willis, um, with a block from Ben Bowie and it was just crazy seeing it. And once you get Tatum in, into the into that open field, deuces. Like, he is hitting yeah. his head on the goalpost. It is over. I um, want to see him and Chuba race each other, by the way. 
Oh, well, in their prime, prime, prime would be interesting, right? Yeah. That'd be really interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, they, that's a, uh, but man, when Tatum hits that hole and he gets those legs churning, it, it is just, oh my gosh, it's, it's fun to watch. Um, the reason I asked you if somebody put you up to this, um, so before the days of concussion protocol and everything else, um, it, so I, Ben Bowie, who was our center, um, he was running off, um, and I'm running down to kick, a, uh, kick, kick uh, excuse me, to kick the PAT, and uh, and I'm just and you know, so he he just crushed a block. Somebody else just opened a massive hole. There goes Tatum, and I go and I you know crack heads with him hit him on the head everything else as he's just trotting off and no big deal to him well i go down and i'm kicking a pat except for everything from here up is black and stars for me oh wow and stars and i was like i could see here under so i could see my spot and wow if you go back and watch the film of me kicking that pat i really do this and really so i can see where I'm kicking the ball and come back down. Wow. And I think Sky was on hold at the time. And Sky was like, hey, you good? And I was like, yeah. He's like, all right. So Sky Ryland. And hit it. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. that's where I ended up hitting the PAT. And I walk off the sideline. I sit down. I put my helmet down. I sit down. And I was like, man, oh, my gosh. Like, it was crazy. Wow. So that one play is, is something that I remember very well simply because of – uh, I've never been hit harder in, in a football game in my life than myself hitting in, in hitting helmets with Ben Bowie, who's my teammate, um, in celebration. So it, it is a true kicker story, um, but it's a uh, yeah. So, but man, anytime you get back to Tatum, yeah, hitting that, it, hitting that hole and just going, it, it's it's a beautiful thing. So you mentioned a name. I was gonna, I actually put the name in the in the question log that I was going to yeah. ask you about this young man because I just remember him so vividly. He was such a great blocker. And he just never seemed like got the credit of how great of a player he was. I remember before that game at OU, I was in Norman. I was at that game. And he just walked around pregame, and he was just in this zone. Like, we're getting ready to kick these guys' ass. I mean, it was just it was just awesome to watch. The young man I'm talking about was Sean Willis. I seriously think he might be the best player at Oklahoma State that nobody ever remembers. That dude was so good. No, there's a – you know, it, it's kind of – I put Sean up there with the offensive line. Um, yeah. Sean never got his due diligence from a running standpoint um, just because he had people like Tatum and Vernon Marenzi and, and Juju and all these kids behind him um, or in, I guess in front of him. But he was Sean Wilson's kid who he's the first guy you want to walk off the bus. Damn right he is. <laughs> he is. He was a massive human being who just um, athlete, just jump out of the gym, just, oh, my gosh, you didn't want to go against him. Uh, I, I mean, I would not want to line up as a, as a linebacker and and say, "Hey, I've got to go head to head with Sean Willis." He is just, he was a beast. Um, Tim Burrows, Mike Denard, yeah, Juju uh, Burrows, Smith. Denard, yeah, yeah, Juju, oh, uh, yeah. Julius Crosland, those Crosland, all fit in that kind of the mold to me. Um, you know, Mike Denard and, and Tim Burrows were my age, right? So I'm like, I, I love those guys. Sean was a year or two younger. Ju, uh, Julian Juju was a little bit couple of years younger than that, but it was getting, watching those guys do the selfless part. Um, yeah. It's what allowed a Tatum Bell and a Vernon Marenzi to do their thing. And, and so there's a lot of those guys like Sean Willis. Um, but man, Sean, Sean was a kid who he brought everything every single time and you yeah. didn't want a piece of it. So, yeah, I mean that yeah, I always, like I say, games are won and lost in the trenches. Um, yep. If you have an offensive line that can block and, and pass block, You've got a chance to win. If you've got a defensive line that, that can get to the quarterback, that can disrupt, can fill holes, get guys off of those linebackers to make them go make plays. Um, it, it's kind of like, you know, this year, and I'm sure we'll talk about it later, but, um, you know, the reason why somebody like a Nick Martin is able to, or a Trey Rucker is able to come down is because th- that D-line is is taking up eating up blocks. blocks. So they're playing yeah. really, really well. Um, which allows Nick to use his speed and to use everything coming through and fitting through that hole and, and getting skinny and, and getting there. So getting the quarterback, that's the type of play though, that doesn't get recognized as much. Um, and so it's, you know, I look across the line at, at, at Sam Mays at a Jason Russell, God rest his soul. Um, I, I look at um, Kyle Eaton. Gosh, I mean, these guys that you don't normally get to talk about, 
just go out there and absolutely crush it, right? And, and so it, it's kind of now on the flip side this year, you've got a, a senior off to line that's six years, uh, you know, everybody across. And then you've got such a weapon of an Ollie Gordon or an, and a Brendan Presley and a Stribling and all these guys on the outside that you can play with. And the off to line isn't, uh, I mean, they're not giving up sacks. They're not giving up, um, you know, pass blocks trying to fit that run block against six guys. And so what yeah, does that right. look like? How can we get more creative is, but I, I'm digressing. I'm going future forward, but yeah. it's, th- those are the type of guys, John Willis, the offensive line, defensive line guys um, that absolutely make things miserable for other teams. And, and, you know, there's so many guys like that. It's, I could sit here all day and tell you about those type of guys that, that make plays, do the selfless things, but make the other people that much better and allow them to go shine and do their thing. Another player during that period that was very underrated was Garrett Staggs. He just made some huge catches for OSU at the tight end spot. Julius crossed the goal line, Mike Denard, Tim Burroughs. Boy, those are some great names from the past right there. Les Miles knew how to find some fullbacks and some maulers up front for offensive linemen and some fastbacks behind it. So Absolutely. Great times there. So you kind of hit on it, but, you know, hey, you've got that connection. Mike Gundy, you played for him while he was the offensive coordinator at OSU, so I'm sure – you're still very connected with the program, living in Tulsa. So talk about the program that he's built here at OSU since he has become the, the head coach. Yeah, so, I mean, as I said, I came home in an orange OSU onesie um, and <laughs> an orange OSU stocking, right? And I, I've uh, cowboy born and cowboy bred, rather be dead than sooner red, right? So <laughs> I, you cut me open, I bleed orange. Um, and I've seen <laughs> – I've seen the the bleak days, right? Yep. I've I was too young to really appreciate those '84 Blue Bonnet Bowls and things like that. I've gotten to know a lot of those guys since, and so I've gotten much more of a respect out of it. Um, I was seven, eight years old, obviously, when Barry Sanders was was running around, Thurman Thomas, Harley Dykes, those guys. When Gundy was a quarterback, um, Kerry Blanchard. I'll throw his name out there as a kicker. Um, yep. Rest his soul as well. Um, and, and it's a. Do you know Larry Roach? So I have met Larry a couple of times. Yeah. Um, I don't know him really well, yeah. Um, but yeah. So it, for me, I've seen the the bleak days. I've seen what it could be in the early 2000s and mid 2000s. Um, obviously you get somebody like an RW McCorders, who is one of the most phenomenal athletes I've ever met late being able to watch personally. Um, and you get him there in 97 and, and everything that he does. And that whole team um, was a phenomenal team of a, a lot of Oklahoma kids too. Yeah. Um, Billy Stone playing safety and dropping down a linebacker. I mean, you get all these kids from the West side, Tim Sidness, who I, I fell in love with kicking because of Tim. Like it was like, okay, here's, here's somebody who is an athlete who plays and, and kicks and has fun and, and everything else. So, and gets along with all those guys. Um, it, but you get into all those things. You have Mike come in as a young coordinator. I think his first year in 05 is the first time that, is the only time that he's had a losing season um, yeah. as a head coach, which is unbelievable to say. And you look over that's the last, because he was cleaning house. I mean, that's, there's a reason. Yeah, for I mean, that, he yeah. kicked off seven starters, yeah, right? right? Um, that weren't doing the right things. I mean, that was two years after I graduated, but it was yeah. still connected enough and to know. But he came in, and something that a lot of people don't give him enough credit for is he came in, solidified a program, and said, "Hey." You know, and I'll, I'll kind of move to the side so you can see what our stadium used to look yeah. like. Yeah, um, right. Right? Uh, yeah. In the field, in Lewis Field there. He came yeah, that's the stadium looked, when you played. That's exactly what it looks like. That's right. Like. Fantastic. So, yeah, so I saw Kai Staley on a couple of weeks ago that, uh, nice. you know, he had the, the new stadium. And I was like, yeah. you know, I, I didn't play in that stadium. This is, ah. this is me right here. So, <laughs> um, that, you know, I was throwing it back. But it's, it, it, yeah, it's one of those things Gunny came in. And he said, hey, look, we're going to have fun. We're going to do this, and we're going to do it the right way. And he went out and recruited. And and he was smart enough, and he learned from Miles, I think. He's smart enough to go get coaches um, that will help the program and help the team. He, he didn't – He didn't. Uh, you know, most people don't know as Miles came in. When he came in, he took a salary cut for what he could have gotten um, paid. And he brought in guys like Carl Dunbar, um, yes. Coach Wyatt. He brought in these guys, um, Munkin. Um, he brought these guys in um, who phenomenal. And he, he saw them, brought them in, gave them a chance, did different things. 
Gundy took that, I think, and did the same thing. I mean, like getting Monk to be your OC, getting Dana Hogerson, and, and yes, a lot of these guys, Tim Beck, a lot of these guys have gone on and done phenomenal things mm-hmm. and still are. The, the one thing that he did, though, is he brought those in and he didn't say, it's my offense, it's my here, it's everything else, let's do it. He, he finally realized, I'm going to be a CEO. You guys are going to be my, you know, branch managers, my sales managers, my everything else, and and go that way. So he did a very good job from that standpoint. Um, but what a job he's done! And a lot of people remember don't remember what it was like to be to be terrible. They don't yeah. remember the three and seven seasons and going out and busting your tail and doing all the things that we used to do to be able to get the three and seven. They're used to now a winning season, going to a bowl game. I don't say taking it for granted, but he has done such a phenomenal job that do you have to agree with everything that he does? No. But do you agree with everything that your boss does or do you ever agree with everything Ever. that maybe your yeah. spouse does? No. But it's a team. It's a family. And those are the type of things to me that it's like, okay, he can, he can, do, he can do all of this, continue to do what he's doing, and he does it at a very high level. I mean, if you told me back in 2000 and 2001 that OSU was going to be – a top 10 winning team over an entire decade or 15 years, I, there's no way. Right. Yeah, right. I mean, like, sure. I'd have been positive and orange, sure. you know, orange glasses, but there's no way. I mean, it, he's done such a phenomenal job at a smaller university with one of the smallest budgets athletically uh, that, that people forget. It's like, Hey, you've, you've taken this magic dust and you've turned it into all of this in, in the stadium that's behind you with Ian T Boone. If if that 01 ha- game doesn't happen, we go back to that 01 game. If that yeah. 01 Bedlam game doesn't happen, T Boone doesn't give the money. Right. He said, I want to do this every single year, and I'll do whatever it takes to be able to get there. He doesn't give his money if Rashawn doesn't catch that ball, if TD doesn't take it away from Roy Williams first, if I don't do my job and kick my field goals, if Josh Fields doesn't play lights out and do what he needs to do. All of these things like start trickling down. But it's even the guys before us not getting too sentimental it's the guys before us that taught us this is how you have to have this osu cowboy mentality and mm-hmm. what to do so it's like we have to look at those and think those guys we kind of put it all together gundy continued it and then just exploded it and took it from there so i can't speak highly enough about gundy do i love everything that he does no but he's true he's going to tell you how it is and he he's He's Gundy, right? I mean, that's the thing is like we love him. It, it, it's it's some people get frustrated because they expect, OK, well, we should be winning a national championship. Well, in my mind, we did win a national championship in 2011. Right. It, it's it, it's ridiculous that we didn't. And we would have thumped absolutely thumped miles and that LSU team. I know that's going to make some people mad, but I, I honestly agree that there's nothing. They didn't have an offense at all. And, and we yeah. throw that ball two or three times and get in the end zone. They're not catching up. And, and so make the defense play 95 plays. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. So it's we have the opportunity. And then the whole Sports Illustrated nonsense comes out and puts a hold on things for a couple of years. And now you've got to try to, okay, let's get this momentum back going. So he's nine years in. I mean, give it – he's he's doing the right things. He's getting the right players for our program. Sure, they're not getting the five stars every single time, but it's a tough whenever you're competing against Blue Bloods uh, down the road and down in Texas and across the country now because that's kind of what a game it is. So, no Gundy, doubt, Gundy no doubt. Done a ton. The way I like to put it is is that hey, I like my leaders to be confident and cocky, and then I like them to also be stubborn because I like them to be convicted in what they're doing. We all think correct. We, I don't want them to be wishy washy, and right. Mike Gundy definitely has all those characteristics correct in spades. And then the way I put it is, hey, what Mike Gundy thinks needs to happen at Oklahoma State is right about 99% of the time. If you want to concentrate on the 1% of the time that he's wrong, that's on you. But yeah. 99% of the time, he he knows exactly what needs to yeah. happen well, at and he, OSU. And he also trusts those guys that he's put in place, right? Yes. He's, he trusts his team, which his team are the coaches. He trusts his team to make help make those decisions and what they're telling him to. Because yeah. he, he can't see it all, but at the same sure. time, He's the CEO. It's going to come back on him, just like a, as a quarterback, it came back on him when lose or right. go, right? Absolutely. So it is what it is, and that's where Gundy, to me, has done such a phenomenal job. Um, it, it's amazing that way. It, it's a um, – he deserves a ton, a ton, a ton of credit for what is going on at Oklahoma State. Okay, man, what do you think about this year's team? Where's the ceiling? Where? What's going to happen here? Of course, they played – 
I'll say I'll put it a, a terrible game last week. It just was sure. not a good game at all. We we moved past that kind of the you know once that Monday press conference happens, you just don't even think about the game the week prior. It's it's on to the next week. So we'll move on to the next week. Right. Where is this team headed? What does Luke Phillips think about? 2024 Oklahoma State football. Yeah, tw- so uh, 24 hour rule is the way I like to put it. Um, you know, after a game, you got 24 hours to celebrate. You got 24 hours to mope. Um, other than that, once that you know, 25th hour comes, it's the business. It's move forward in the future. There's a reason why the windshield's bigger than the rearview mirror. So yes, right. Um, <laughs> as I look at it, it's a uh, this team is very senior laden. A uh, lot of experience on the field on both sides. And it's nothing to take away from um, it's nothing to take away from the defense. I think the defense played phenomenal last week, um, minus a few things of we were trying to strip the ball every single time we were getting a hold of somebody, and we're ripping them down for five yards, six yards right. later, or they're breaking tackles because we're not wrapping up and tackling and do, doing the basics right. right. Not that's OSU football, um, but they played lights out and phenomenal. Other than that. Um, offensively, I think we just got to get creative. Um, it's, you know, we got really creative whenever we were against Arkansas in the, um, figured some things out, got back in the game in, in the overtime when we flipped that ball outside and, and ran, you know, on the, I think it was the two point play. That's the type of stuff to me that we've got to get creative on how to get Ollie Gordon, one of your best players, the ball. I think Gundy even said, I don't know when it was, but he, he said in the past, at least that if, if somebody's going to stack the box against your best running back that you have, and they're going to say, beat me with a throw, and you don't get the ball somehow and find ways to get the ball to your guy, it's not going to happen. Right. Um, I think in the first I think the first half last week, Brandon Presley had touched the ball three times. Um, you can't do that. I, I know you, you they're playing cover one, and they're, they're funneling inside everything else. I don't think we ran too many plays across the middle. Our tight ends, I don't think, had anything. I think we just got to get more creative on offense. And the passing game is going to open up the running game to an extent um, because if you can show that you can pass and you can do these things and you can get the ball over the middle, I mean, shoot, you've got one of the physically most dominating receivers to me when you look at um, Rashad Owens. I yeah, mean, no like, doubt. Put him over the middle. Presley's yeah, not afraid to go I agree. Either, but use those drags. Use those things. Um, it, the, the offensive line's holding up in a pass for, in a pass pro. It's figuring out a way for those guys to get nasty and to get dirty again. I, I wish, and, you know, I know, gosh, I wish Sam Mays could yeah. get in there and just put his hand on the ground and show them what it is to just bull road grade. <laughs> and road grade those. Yeah. And that's, it's it's an attitude and everything else. And I know those guys have it. Some of those guys can be really nasty. You got to have a little hook in you to be an off lineman, um, to be a really good off lineman at least. And, I know that they've done it in the past. I know that they can do it. Um, I think we've got to be get more creative to find ways to switch things up and get Ollie Gordon the ball um, in space. Um, yeah, I agree. In, we're running tackle, tackle, tackle. Yeah. And I get it. But you know what? You're trying to keep them honest. You're trying to – to me, it's, man – show levels right you get ollie gordon out in the flat you got a crosser coming over you've got a yeah. post coming over top of him so now you have three different options um i just i think that there's got to be some more creativity on offense but i mean you look at k-state since we're talking about the future and what k-state's going to do what happened to them <laughs> right in, yeah in right week, right i mean it's just like oh my gosh like you've got to be kidding me um I think this, byu is good for one and, and really byu is good yeah. um but i i just it, it for K State to be what K State is supposed to be, um, yeah, right. I, I was shocked at that outcome of that mm-hmm. game and, and watching a little bit of that and what it looked like. BYU yeah. played in home, played really well. Um, the the interesting thing that I look at for the rest of the season is everything is still in front of you, right? Everything is still there for what you want to accomplish um, with the expanded um, playoff system. You can still get in the playoffs; and anything can happen. I think you know in. in if you go back last year, Ollie Gordon wasn't Ollie Gordon until after game four, five. So we lost Iowa State right before we beat, or right before we beat K State, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, you've got all of these things. Um, you've got all of these things still in front of you. That if you look even back to last year, they, they can still figure it out. They can still go and be the Big Twelve champion, right? I, I mean, I mm-hmm. honestly believe that. I mean that. 
Yes, still Utah there for was you. a good team, but I, I mean, I don't look at Utah as like a world beater. They did some nice things running the ball. Um, they were able to con- continue and keep possession, keep us out of our groove. But they're not world beaters, in my opinion. Yeah. They're a good team, solid, but they're not, you know, yeah. oh, my gosh. Like, they are far and above anybody else in this Big 12. I think that there's still everything out in front of them. If they can come to play, and people ask me all the time, hey, what do you think about this weekend's game? And I always say, which team is going to show up and play? Right. Yeah. Because it was Jekyll and Hyde last year. You look at, you know, beating you know, OU and then UCF and all these other – I mean, like, you just go back and forth with all these things. Um, it, w- what can happen – it's these guys focus to be able to go out and do the things they can do. It's still out in front of them. I still think that the back half of our schedule um, favors a very good run at the end. Mm -hmm. This was going to be this first five, six games was going to be a very difficult um, test um, just because of who you're playing. You didn't really have TU. um, Okay. But you had a, you know, two-time national, you know, Division two champion in North Dakota State coming 27 in. Twenty-seven game win streak. Right. Yeah. You have Arkansas coming in right after that. You have <clears throat> okay, a little break against TU. Excuse me, a little get break against TU, and then you you have you open up with number twelve Utah at home, and then you've got to go two K State, and I mean like it, it's okay, and then so obviously Iowa State's going to be a, a tough, um, a, a tough out for anybody in the Big Twelve this year. K State's always going to play. Um, Arizona, Arizona State's going to be interesting to see, you know, how they continue to progress. Um, I'm anything can happen when you have athletes on one side of the ball with Colorado coming in the end of the season um, and all the hoop that's going to everything's coming that way. I think we can set that game up to be um, a, a non-factor. I and if, if Colorado, to me, if Colorado doesn't have a, uh, a potential at a bowl or potential winning season at the time. I think that uh, Sanders and uh, Hunter might even sit that type of a game or you, you beat them once or twice and you let Nick Martin hit him across the side of the head or, you, you yeah. know, you do something that way. And it's, yeah. it, it, they give up and think I'm going to make a business decision now because no I'm gonna plan, you know, at the next level. And so I want to make a business decision. The season's over. So hopefully that's, I think the back half of the schedule, makes it really solid for OSU to really make a run. If we can get by K-State at K-State, which Manhattan's a, a tough place to play, um, if we can get by them, and in, I think, Iowa State, and, and, and obviously we've got, I think, Arizona or Arizona State coming. So, Yep, it's going to be a lot of fun. So Oklahoma yep. State's going to have to play better than they did last week if they Absolutely. want to have any chance at Manhattan. Going to have to stop the run better than what they've done and then also run the ball Correct. So, hey, Luke Phillips, I have taken a whole lot of your time. I know <laughs> no, you're, good. you're super busy chasing the kids and yep. and, and all the job and, and all that kind of stuff. So this is just so kind of you to spend this much time here at O-State Daily to share some of these great memories and your thoughts of this year's team. So yep. thank you so much, Luke Phillips. And any Anytime. It's one of those things that uh, I, I love it. I could talk OSU and talk sports all the time. My friends Joe can say that I could kill a tree by talking to it. So uh, anytime we're talking to OSU, we can do it. So go Pokes. Right? Oh, yeah. Let's no, go. wait a minute. I got to give it a reverse. Yeah, that's backwards. Hold on. There you go. One more time. One more time. One more time. Okay. Say go pokes with it, baby. Oh, yeah, there you go. It's still backwards, but that's okay. We'll I think that anyway. get it fixed. We're okay there. Okay, Luke Phillips, thank you so much. I certainly appreciate you joining O State Daily. Hopefully, this is not the last time we talk. No, anytime, Casey. You let me know.